Hello, I'm Brett Moss, and you're watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. Our guest today is Dr. Antonio Betancourt. Dr. Betancourt is the director of the Office of Government Affairs for the Universal Peace Federation in Washington, D.C. He's also the executive director of both the Summit Council for World Peace and the Association for the Unity of Latin America. Dr. Betancourt is president of the World Institute for Development and Peace, which is dedicated to advancing economic justice and democratization. Antonio Betancourt is married to Kyoko Funayama, and together they have four children. In July of 2007, he and his wife will celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. Dr. Antonio Betancourt, I cannot thank you enough for your generosity in being here today and flying out from Washington to attend this interview. So thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. I think our time will be very productive. I am happy to be here in Santa Monica. I'd love to come to California. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Our topic today is a vision for the reunification of the Korean Peninsula. You've visited North Korea 17 times to facilitate high-level dialogue with top government officials in North Korea. You've met face-to-face -face with the late President Kim Il-sung on five occasions. And you have met with current President Kim Jong-il twice. The purpose of all your diplomatic efforts in North Korea have been to promote peace and security in Northeast Asia. Dr. Betancourt, before we discuss today's topic, I want to ask you to share a defining moment based on your unique experience in forging a pathway for reunification of North and South Korea. The defining moment is connected with um, the mission of Father Moon, Reverend Moon. Um, Reverend Sun Moon was born in North Korea. And as a Korean, he is the only one who has a base in 180 countries, including the U.S., a very large base that can be used for peace in the peninsula. So this is a man that will not go away after five years, like the president or a prime minister. He will remain there as a key player in the affairs of the peninsula. So a defining moment was how to um, create the conditions in which the Reverend Moon with Mrs. Moon will come back to North Korea after 40 years from his departure. He departed North Korea from a concentration camp in 1951. The return of Reverend Moon to reconcile with the leader who took away his uh, position uh, in the 1940s to reconcile with him and reconcile with the regime and to begin a process of healing of the relationships between these two leaders that was really a defining moment for the process of unification. And because you... before there can be unification, they have to be a process of reconciliation and healing. And that process began in November 30th, 1991, when Father Moon entered North Korea. And you were intimately involved in the behind the scenes. And I was uh, intimately involved in that process. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, thank you so much. For many years, you've held executive leadership positions in high-level international organizations founded by Reverend Dr. Moon and his wife. Uh, please share with us what is Dr. Moon's vision for the reunification of the Korean Peninsula and what is unique about his behind the scene efforts to foster dialogue and promote the reunification of North and South Korea. The core of Father Moon's uh, teachings is to love your enemy. In other words, is to love, to uh, reconcile with your enemies. It's a situation in which there is no winners and losers, in which everybody wins, the South Koreans, the North Koreans, the Americans, everybody. For this, uh, he is teaching uh, the teachings of true love. He's teaching to reconcile, love your enemy. 
North and South Korea has been enemies uh, since the war. The U.S. and North Korea are enemies. Each one has enormous list of grievances against each other. So Father Moon consistently has been teaching to forgive, to love, to unite, to reconcile. That doesn't mean that you deny the grievances. The grievances are there. But you have to move to a higher plane to forgive, uh, to love each other, and to see a future together, building together, mm. a new nation, mm. a new Korea. Okay, very interesting. Thank you so much. Tell us about some of the agreements that Reverend Moon and Kim Il-sung, late President Kim Il-sung, made concerning Reverend Moon's role for the reunification of North and South Korea. What kind of agreements were made between the two, the two leaders? Kim Il-sung understood the role of Reverend Moon in South Korea and also in the world as a person who will remain a player for years and years and years to come. So he was willing to enter into some kind of agreement, what was called the 10-point communique. And in this 10-point communique, Kim Il-sung committed himself to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. He committed himself to promote uh, bilateral uh, relations or bilateral uh, discussions at the prime ministerial level. And it's a list of, of things that uh, Kim Il-sung committed himself to do uh, that he will carry it out with the help of Raven Moon for the sake of, first, peace and stability in Northeast Asia and the Korean Peninsula, and to embark the country into a process of restructuring of uh, the economy uh, that will lead towards uh, a transformation, a uh, slow process of transformation of the North Korean economy and the regime uh, uh, in order for North Korea to join the community of nations. Mm. Uh, so that's my understanding. Okay, great. Thank you. Now, Korea was divided 61 years ago in 1945. Do South Koreans today really yearn for a reunification? The older generations, they, they do yearn for, for unification because there are millions of families that have been still separated. It's an aging uh, community, mm. you know, they're, they're getting old, but they still uh, uh, longing to see each other and to come together. The younger generation uh, is in their blood, is there, but it is more restrained because they have seen the experiences of Germany and they know that there is a big price to pay if they uh, precipitate uh, this process. In other words, uh, this process has to be well thought and be uh, controlled and restrained. Uh, but they all want unification. They all see uh, a unified peninsula, a unified Korea. Uh, they, they long to see that. Perhaps the older people more than the young people. Mm. Okay, thank you. Of the non-Korean members of the six-party talks, uh, namely U.S., China, Russia, and Japan, which nations have an authentic commitment to supporting Korean unification, in your opinion? I think the, the uh, declarations on unification, in my opinion, are more rhetoric, more rhetorical. The, the, a unified Korea presents a question to China, to Japan, to the U.S., to Russia. Um, I think for now uh, their interest is to see uh, tensions being reduced. They, they want to uh, see a, a Korean peninsula um, at peace and a process of, of uh, a process of restructuring of North Korea being uh, carried out peaceful, peacefully. Okay, great, thank you. 
In the past, prevailing wisdom in South Korea for unification contemplated the collapse of North Korea and its eventual absorption by the South. How has this view changed uh, based on more recent experience? This particular paradigm of absorption was in the minds of, of, of the North and the South for many years. But change, uh, time has changed. Uh, of course, there may be some crazies out there in both countries, and therefore the need to have the U.S. there to restrain these crazies who may entertain some, some ideas in how they want to do without thinking of the consequences. But there are rational people on both sides who would not like to see uh, a collapse of the North. Uh, they do not entertain the absor absorption. Uh, there are a lot of people in South Korea who will see that they cannot digest the North as it is right now. So they are willing to help the North to uh, prepare for unification. And, uh, and the North also understands that. They, they don't want to be absorbed and they understand that they cannot absorb the South. They cannot. Neither one can digest the other. Okay, very good. Thank you. How does a potentially diminishing U.S. presence on the peninsula affect the near the near-term prospects for unification? If a vacuum is created, who will exercise great, greater influence on the peninsula? That scenario is not for the future. That, that scenario is for the present. Mm. The biggest uh, uh, profiteer of the situation in the peninsula today with this impasse between the U.S. and North Korea has been China. Mm. China needs a buffer country between capitalist South Korea and, and the present uh, China. China is embarked in a, in a market economy, but it still is one party. Communist system? Uh, not the communist system, it's a mixture. Okay. It, it is uh, almost like a military dictatorship okay. controlled by the military. They will change, mm. but it will take time. Mm. In the meantime, they don't want uh, a, a capitalistic peninsula at the doorsteps. I see. They want something that they can control uh, slowly until they can uh, come out with a solution to their own uh, headaches of, of, of modernization. Mm. Uh, so China is the biggest beneficiary of a vacuum in the peninsula. That's mm. something we have to watch. Mm. Uh, the U.S. is needed there because the U.S. is the only uh, power, together with the European Union, that can bring a process of transformation of the North Korean economy, transformation of the North Korean regime peacefully, and the institutionalization of reforms and changes. Um, the, uh, the South cannot do it alone. They need the support of the United States. But the U.S. cannot do this by giving ultimatums what they are traditionally do. Ultimatums, deadlines, threats. That is not conducive to the achievement of what the U.S. interests are and achievement of the interests of South Korea and even North Korea and so forth. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Based on your unique vantage point, on balance, what kind of time frame can you imagine for a major breakthrough to happen in the attainment of Korean reunification? I think because of, of the, uh, what's happening with, with the new educated class in South Korea, uh, and also the new educated class in Russia and China and so forth, there is also a new class emerging in North Korea. I will give a time of eight years, mm. especially because of the influence of information technology. We mm -hmm. cannot uh, discount the enormous impact of information technology in North Korea today mm. and, uh, and the enormous impact for the region. The 
key is what the U.S. will do in this next uh, few years. Mm. If they continue to demand certain preconditions for a bilateral dialogue, then we can see, you know, a delay. But things can go rather fast. The, the uh, transformation of the North Korean can be done relatively fast if uh, more diplomacy is involved, if a more moderate uh, um, regime can be established. And for that, the six-party talks are it's a good vehicle, but it doesn't replace bilateral relations, bilateral uh, uh, um, discussions and bilateral um, uh, agreements. If we have a higher moral imperative, let's put it out of, out of front and deal with an enemy that we feel no respect and we know that treating them with respect with maybe lead us uh, to, to nothing, which many people believe. Why should we respect them when they don't respect us? Why should we treat them with, 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 uh, with uh, dignity when they don't give us any dignity? Well, let, let them do that. But we cannot level with our enemies like that, with our adversaries. We have to elevate our adversaries to negotiators. And you do not do that by demonizing the adversary who has uh, very little credibility before their own people or with international educated public opinion. You've got to elevate them to your level. And that a nation as the U.S., the European Union, South Korea, they can do it because they are in the upper have every possible uh, 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 base to, to allow themselves to be generous without demonstrating weakness. Okay, very good, thank you. Now you've made many trips to North Korea. You've had many experiences over there. What are some of the most important lasting impressions that you have had through your visits to North Korea about the North Korean people, the North Korean culture, the, the way of life there? Um, you know, when people have no access to the modern world, of course you can say that they are backwards in many things. But the modern world happened to have a lot of bad things also. So the fact that they've been out of the loop for 61 years, that means that there's a lot of sophistication in how we lie, how we cheat, <laughs> um, in promiscuity, in all kinds of things that are not very healthy in the West, in North Korea, are absent. I think we have to allow the country to open up without losing their soul. It is sad that the first publication that came to Russia, to the Soviet, uh, the so-called Soviet Union, once they opened up, was Playboy and Penthouse Publishing. Instead of, you know, great, great publishing houses with great books and great things, I think North Korea uh, should learn from the experience of Russia and uh, allowed a more uh, uh, restrained kind of openness because it's much easier to be evil than to be good. It's much easier to be greedy than to be selfless. So they have a lot to, to see of what happened with Germany, what happened with Russia, what happened with the Eastern Bloc, what's happening with China now. China, unfortunately, is going back to 1949. Big gap between the very rich and the very poor. So they have to learn. And we, as ambassadors for peace or P3, 
people of good conscience, we have to help them, you know, to, be, to make the right choices, to free the country without uh, uh, getting the worst spoils of the West. Okay, very good, thank you. What about the North Korean people has impressed you the most? As the Koreans, you know, North and South Koreans, uh, I'm always amazed by their sincerity, you know, their passion for the things they do, their generosity. They are enormously generous people. Um, their commitment to their country, to their values, to their system. They, uh, you know, North Korea is, they, they say that it's a communist country, but it's, it's, it's not that simple. North Korea, for me, is more like uh, a large monastery without God, with, with uh, military uh, uh, power deciding the affairs of this big monastery. People live, like in monasteries, a very ascetic life, a very harsh, difficult, disciplined life, centered on the worship of the late Kim Il-sung and now his son Kim Jong-il. They live a very difficult life, but in many cases they don't know anything better. Uh, their ideology of Juche is a mixture of Kim il suism communism coming from Marx and Engels, plus the absolutism of the Korean kings and Korean dynasties of the past. They need to reform, but the reformation cannot come just by bringing pure, raw, capitalism from the South, with moral relativism from America, and a worship of consumerism. There are all the wonderful things that we have, that America has to offer, that South Korea has to offer. And it is for people of goodwill and people of conscience who can help them to accommodate and help them to find their, themselves. In the process, we become better. South Koreans will be better than Americans will be better. Okay, very interesting, thank you. Now in your visits to North Korea, you, whenever you go over there, I understand you go through quite a process uh, as you uh, listen to the, the propaganda and so forth, uh, just in order to be able to accomplish whatever uh, mission you have in going there. What are some of your experiences in having to uh, absorb the messages that the North Korean government has for people who come to visit their country? What is that like to, to, to hear what they have to say to you? Well, it's interesting. I was one of the first unificationist followers of Reverend Moon who went there openly as a follower of Reverend Moon, who for, according to theirs, uh, their, their history, for, was more than 40 years of deep s s hatred or struggle against that regime. So they had a lot of grievances against my leader, <laughs> the unification movement or unification church, and deep grievances against my adoptive country of America. I, I was born in Colombia, but I adopted this nation as my country. So I have to be the recipient of enormous vile and, and anger and uh, and hatred from them. But I was trained by Reverend Moon to learn to love the enemy, to see them as my brothers, in disagreement with their attitude, with their uh, hatred or their animosity, but understanding this is my brother and knowing that I have to love them so that helped me to restrain myself and instead of having a match of you say this and you do this and this and that, I could listen with a, a high degree of peace in my heart 
listen to what they have to say. Once they emptied themselves, they were ready, they were ready to listen to me and to what I have to say about Father Moon's love for the country and what we could do to help them to begin a serious dialogue with the U.S. that eventually led to the signing the, their agreements of, of 1994, agreements that were broken not, but not only by the North Koreans. They were broken by both. It's easy to blame it all on North Korea. But those who know, they know what the U.S. had to do with, with this. So we understood, or I understood, that my mission there was to be a peacemaker, a unifier, and a harmonizer. Now, why is it that nations and peoples of the world should feel that they, too, have a stake in the reunification of North and South Korea? Well, the problem is that we live in a world that, whether we like it or not, is marching towards one world. And the dysfunction of one region, it becomes my problem. So the problems of the Korean Peninsula are not just disattached to Colombia, or to Argentina, or Indonesia, the US, Canada, Russia. They're connected. A war in the Korean Peninsula is not in the interest neither of the region nor of, of remote regions of the world. No. It destabilizes the family economic affairs of Americans, of people in California or Montana. Everyday life. Yeah, their daily, their, 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 their daily life will be disturbed because today those things are not isolated. Everything the the is, world has become too integrated. It's too integrated, it's interconnected, all of that. And there is also, the people are growing in their, in their uh, social consciousness. There is a certain social consciousness that tells people in their hearts, we should not allow that. You know, that is wrong. There is a certain uh, degree of, con of, of, of uh, justice. People are, are, you know, worldwide on the right and on the left. Social justice. Yeah, of, of, of social conservatism or, of, uh, you know, there is a certain degree of understanding that, that we have to help the brother. We have to help other, other countries. There are certain things in the world that just shouldn't be tolerated. Exactly. Okay. And people want these uh, ancient problems to be resolved peacefully through dialogue. They don't want confrontation. Mm. They don't want uh, um, uh, military solutions. Military should be the last resource, not the first one. Mm. Dr. Antonio Betancourt, our time is up for this interview. I want to thank you so much for being here today and sharing from your wisdom and your experience. It's really a very enlightening experience to listen to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I hope I had contributed somehow to your obje objectives. Absolutely you have. Thank you so much and God bless you. you. You've been watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. You can find us on the internet at www.definingmoment.tv. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.